Welcome to another episode of Wealth Uncensored. I'm joined again today by my friend David Pising, a personal fiduciary in Guernsey. And today we're going to be talking about the importance uh, of having a professional board member on the board of your private trust company or foundation. Welcome, David. Always a pleasure to see you. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. I'm delighted to be involved again. All right. One of the things that I'm sure you've encountered this over your long career is that a lot of times clients, especially ultra high net worth clients, are very nervous about handing over their wealth to a professional trustee because they're nervous about the trustee taking off with their money or stealing it or mismanaging it. Although that's something that happens, I think, very rarely these days, given how well-regulated trustees are. Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton, Let's dive into today's show. They also have other concerns that if they have a third party involved, they're not going to be as nimble and be able to act as quickly as they'd like to be or that investments that they would like made aren't being made. And so a lot of times in order to maintain that control, they opt for a private trust company or if in the case of a foundation, foundation board that is not comprised of, of professional trustees or professional directors. Though either in the case of a foundation or a PTC, what I see a lot with several of my clients is that they want a board that's comprised of their family members, sometimes some close friends and trusted advisors, so that they basically have people that they trust on the board. And I think one of the things that always makes me very nervous when clients want to do this, and one of the things that I always share with them is that none of these people that they elect to the board generally have any sort of experience in managing a private trust company and administering trust or managing a, a, a foundation because there's a lot that goes into it, especially if we're talking about a private trust company with that's managing a, a trust. One of the, the big issues is whenever you're contemplating an investment or a distribution or, or whatever, you can't consider what's in the best interest of the settler, right? I mean, you have a fiduciary duty to the beneficiaries and you have to consider what is in the best interest of all of the beneficiaries, why this transaction is taking place. Sometimes it's a little bit easier with, with a foundation since the, in most countries, the fiduciary duties to the foundation itself are not the beneficiaries, but there's still proper administration. You still have to consider the fiduciary duty you certainly need to maintain proper co corporate governance and make sure that you have proper resolutions and meeting minutes and documentation, accounting, all of this kind of stuff. You can't just treat it like a personal piggy bank and do this or that. And so I always advise clients that they need to get somebody on the board who's a professional that knows what they're doing. And I know that's something that you do mm -hmm. is act as one of these professionals both with respect to, to foundations and private trust companies. And so I just wanted to get you, your thoughts on th this topic, what value a professional director brings to, to the board, what sort of risks are out there for people who don't have a professional on the board, and what the consequences could be of, of managing a, a trust or, or a foundation without having the requisite knowledge and experience what could happen to the board member or, or the trustee if things weren't done in, in line with accepted practices? Yeah, quite a lot to cover there. In, in nearly every case that I've come across, there is a professional administrator dealing with the day-to-day -day administration of the trust. And in some jurisdictions, that may not even be mandatory, but I've not yet come across a, a sort of a PTC or a foundation type structure where there isn't a a professional administrator involved there, but the professional administrator doesn't always automatically have a representation on, on the board, although in several jurisdictions that is a requirement, really, that there is a, 
a representation on the board, albeit that would be a minority representation. The aspect then, of course, is that it is a minority representation and therefore that professional representative of the administrator on the board would be in a minority and therefore can be outvoted on anything. However, that's not really enough because that doesn't give you independence. It doesn't give families usually enough comfort that somebody is really looking over the shoulder of the professional administrators and making sure that things are being done as they should be. Hence the role for a totally independent person on the board, usually alongside a representative of the service provider. And then that's quite normal. You'd have perhaps a majority of directors being provided by the family or through their family representatives. And of course, even making up a constitution of that board, clearly one has to think about the tax residency status of the of the family directors to avoid the PTC becoming tax resident somewhere else. So all of these factors, of course, need to be built into the structure. But I think the you're absolutely right that one of the biggest weaknesses is that whilst you may have families who are reasonably familiar with trusts because they've had trust structures for, for some time and they perhaps have evolved from having a, a, a trust with a, a financial institution into setting up their own PTC, they won't be familiar with what is actually required to administer those trusts or the foundation correctly in the sense of, yes, fiduciary duty, considering the interests of the beneficiaries regarding the underlying trusts. And that's something they need their hands held on really throughout. And that's why having an independent person on the board who can sit between the family and the service provider and actually guide them as to why certain things have to happen in a certain way. Is it best practice? Is it mandatory? Is it a statutory requirement? Is it a nice to have? There's going to be a great variance between some of those some of those functions. And the needs, requirements and wishes of families will vary from structure to structure. And of course, you will often get a turning point in the life of that structure when the settler or the founder of the foundation passes away and therefore is no longer there in the background or may also have been a, a director on the, the board of the PTC or on the, the council of the of the foundation. And they're suddenly no longer there. And then you have family members put in a position where they're making more significant decisions without that, let's call it a comfort blanket of knowing that this is really what the settler would have wanted because he or she is no longer around. So that independent person has a, a variety of roles to play as a, if you like, a steward, as an independent advisor, as a, a wise old head, almost perhaps trying to preempt problems that might arise rather than dealing with them after they have arisen, because prevention is better than cure. And you've also seen more recently, it was earlier this year, in fact, Jersey has passed legislation regarding PTCs, which uh, places much more onus on the family members of a PTC in terms of AML responsibilities, which until then were pretty much uh, dealt with by the service provider. And the, the, the family member, board members of the PTC didn't really have to worry too much about that. Well, now they do. Uh, and that has caused some consternation in the private client world. It may or may not make Jersey less attractive as a jurisdiction for PTCs. And that's certainly what I'm hearing. I haven't seen any real anecdotal, more than anecdotal evidence on that. But it's starting, I think, to have an impact on whether people actually choose Jersey as their domicile for, for the PTC. Now, that may well be something that other jurisdictions replicate in due course, and therefore that factor then starts to erode. But at the moment, I think that is relevant. Now, if you're a family member and you've been asked to sit on the board of a PTC and you're sort of happy to do so, and now you're faced with extra sort of regulatory responsibilities on the board of a PTC, is that really what you signed up to? Are you comfortable doing that? Would you rather not do it? And if you'd rather not do it and you want to come off the board, how does that change the dynamics of that board? Do you then end up with reluctant board members or do you end up with a greater representation from either the service provider or a second independent director? And of course, whilst you do any of that, you are perhaps eroding the amount of uh, influence and board control that the family had over the PTC in the first place. 
which may actually then lead you back towards saying, you know what, I'd rather have a standalone trust with an independent service provider because actually the PTC might not be doing what it did two or three years ago in terms of how we wanted to operate. So a lot of factors involved there in that whole dynamic. I think when you're talking about Jersey and extra AML burden being placed on the family board members, I think this is something that that's very much moving in the direction of Malta. Malta requires all of the directors of a PTC to submit a personal questionnaire and go through vetting with the Malta Financial Services Authority. Up until recently, they just changed this rule. We're actually required to have a money laundering reporting officer that either needed to be a board member or a senior managing official. And one of the requirements of of their BTC statute is that you're required to have somebody on the board with experience in administering trusts, which definitely makes the Maltese regime burdensome in in terms of compliance and, and, and maintaining it. But I do think it probably results in better managed trusts. No, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think the trend, if you mentioned Jersey, you mentioned Malta, I suspect that trend may well continue. Interestingly, because obviously being based in Guernsey, whether this was to be driven by money valve or recent money valve visits that Guernsey and Jersey have both had, Guernsey has a different form of oversight of PTCs by the regulator to Jersey. And... At the moment, there is no need and no anticipation that Guernsey will go down the same route that Jersey has gone down. Personally, I think Jersey's got that wrong. And I know several lawyers in Jersey who firmly believe that Jersey possibly got that wrong. But nevertheless, it's out there and it's a mainstream trust jurisdiction. And therefore, it could well become a trend that gets followed. But I think that's the direction of travel, to, to be honest. And whether that's over the next 12 months, three years, five years, whatever, I think we need to be mindful of that sort of requirement. But you're absolutely right that once you've done all that, even if you've done it reluctantly, you probably will end up with perhaps a more robust regime anyway in terms of how boards get constituted. But it's going to be an ever-changing scenario, I think, in years to come. So there, there are still a few jurisdictions out there, specifically the UAE and the US, which don't require company administrators at all. You need a, a registered agent for the PTC or the foundation, but there's no requirement that they're involved in the business or the operations of that PTC or foundation whatsoever. And those are always the ones where I see a lot of risk of things not being done properly, because a lot of times you have a a foundation or a PTC where the settler or the founders on the board, along with some family members, and they probably don't even understand proper corporate governance, let alone administering a trust or a foundation. And then the other problem is, even if they do understand proper corporate governance, uh, I think it's rare that you see people that even remember to hold the board meetings or do resolutions for every decision and document what the considerations were in in taking the decision. I think that's absolutely right. I think it's almost a case of some jurisdictions being able to give the client what they want as opposed to what they really need and it not being in their best interest to have what they want. There are scenarios like that which could survive quite happily for many years until maybe suddenly there's some litigation and some aggrieved beneficiaries want to challenge aspects of the trust. And if that trust uh, uh, through the PTC has been run in a certain way for a decade or more and the courts start pouring over documentation which doesn't exist, not going to get you very far, I think. It's a shortcut. And you might get away with it if none of those issues ever arise. But a lot of families might then be regretting taking the the shortcut. And I think that's to be avoided. But of course, those jurisdictions are still very good jurisdictions, extremely good jurisdictions. And if the right constitution of the board is created, then those jurisdictions will be extremely popular. Yeah, I think try and preempting these problems by not giving the client what they want and giving them what they actually need is probably where the advisor should be ideally aiming to go. What do you see as some of the risks to a board of a PTC or a foundation if it wasn't, for lack of a better word, if it wasn't properly governed? They didn't document the meetings and, and didn't do resolutions for the various decisions that they basically did whatever the founder wanted or, or the settler wanted 
without really making any sort of proper considerations of what's in the best interest of the beneficiaries or something like that? What, what are some of the possible risks that people could face? I think the most extreme uh, risk would be that perhaps the trusts, the underlying trusts could be deemed by a court to be a sham because the trustee was never really in control of the assets in the way that they should have been. Now, that can be disastrous for many reasons. I think for the board members themselves, they almost certainly would have DNO insurance in place that would protect them to the extent that they acted properly. But if they weren't acting properly, would the DNO cover, for example, if they in gross negligence and all sorts of things, they may be protected under the trust deed for acting negligible or making an error. But if it's bordering willful neglect or being turning a, a Nelsonian and blind eye to what's going on and just rubber stamping everything, I can see all kinds of, whether it's regulatory in those jurisdictions where it is regulated or civil law issues arising, basically just challenging whether the, the directors of the trustee actually acted appropriately and therefore should they be in any way indemnified for the way that they've acted. It's a real black hole really in terms of the things that could go wrong and the implications for the families. I don't think it would be that easy for somebody, a family member for example, just to claim that they were a a layman acting and therefore shouldn't be faced with the same level of responsibility as a professional trustee. But a professional director, but if the duties really weren't understood by that director before being appointed, you can see all kinds of things going wrong that wouldn't have gone wrong had they really understood what it was they were letting themselves in for. It's one of those where doing a favour could heavily backfire uh, on them. And of course, the other aspect is, is is really where it's a bit like acting as a protector of a trust. Do you really want to be the person or one of the people in your family making major decisions which affect different members of the family. You're possibly having to take sides in big family disputes. Is that what you signed up to? Is that what you really wanted to do? So I think that the most important lesson really is to make sure that when you structure a PTC from the outset, you give real thought to who should be on that board, what are their duties, fully explain it to them and make sure that they really understand it and let them know exactly what it is they're letting themselves in for, both from a, a civil point of view, from a regulatory, so strategy point of view, and also from the family point of view of not wanting to be at the centre of a massive family dispute. And as I say, a lot of these factors change quite considerably once the settler or the founder, the patriarch or matriarch, is no longer on this earth. As we know, that's when families really start turning up the heat on any litigation. And they'll attack any weakness in a structure. So planning it properly from rather than rushing into it, I think is an absolute must. You're absolutely right. I think usually this board role by a family member or a trusted advisor or a family friend or something is usually taken on as a favor. It's like, hey, you're my cousin or you're my brother or you're my buddy. Will you be on my board? And they say, oh, yeah, it's an honor to serve on your board and to be able to help you. But I think that there's very few instances where those people truly understand, A, what is required of them to do the job properly, and B, what the consequences are of not doing it properly, both for the structure and for them personally. The other thing I wanted to touch on that you mentioned is insurance, because I think any professional director or counselor is either going to have their own insurance or is going to, at the very least, insist that there's DNO insurance for the entire board, professional liability insurance. But I see it in so many structures where this is not done, which is really, uh, you know, in, in my view, not the best idea, especially if you have a large beneficiary base. And then I, the other one that I think is really important, which I think a lot of people don't give any consideration to, are the tax issues of where the board members are are tax resident. Because then you certainly risk a PTC, a foundation, even potentially a, a trust that's administered by, by a PTC becoming tax resident somewhere where you really didn't want it to be tax resident. Because 
the majority of the decisions are being taken. You might have a, a Guernsey Trust at a Guernsey PTC, but if all the board members are living in Germany, uh, then there's going to be a very good argument that the central control and management is in Germany and that it's actually a German tax resident subject to tax there. Absolutely. Yep. I think that that's something that is really not given enough consideration by, by most people. One of the things that I like to do, especially if you have a lot of directors in, in high tax countries, and I haven't had this challenge by a tax authority, I, I don't know if it would work, but I, I, I presume it probably would, is if you had, let's say, one director in, in Guernsey to say that it's maybe a majority board decision to take any decision, but the Guernsey resident director has to be in favor of it. Otherwise, it can't be taken, even if the, the majority of the rest of the board wanted to take the decision. Uh, because I think that does, to a certain extent, negate control in any of the other places if, if no decision could be taken without, let's say, the Guernsey director. I think that's absolutely right. I think there's a strong case for being able to structure the constitution of the board meetings in requirements under the articles in that way. I think obviously a bit like corporate boards, you could insist that all board meetings are held within a jurisdiction, which means that you you get this slightly grey area where in between board meetings, if any decisions are being made or even considered, do you start to fall within where the board member is resident as opposed to where the decision is taken. I, uh, I think you probably succeed with with winning an argument if all board decisions must be made in the jurisdiction, like Guernsey, for example. But I wouldn't like to absolutely rely on that if that was being challenged. I think that would be a, a belt and braces rather than, than anything else. Some tax authorities look to where the directors are thinking about making their decisions. Are they contemplating their decisions when they're back home in their other jurisdiction? Are they simply turning up in the in the offshore jurisdiction to rubber stamp a decision that, in effect, might have already been made? And I think that is such a dangerous area that one, one would have to be very careful about how, how that was dealt with. It's far better to have your directors resident in safe jurisdictions in the first place and to have them perhaps split across several jurisdictions so that it's not resident in any one of those jurisdictions. But yeah, taxes are, and particularly for people who perhaps come from parts of the world where corporate tax residency is not necessarily something that they are familiar with. A lot of the GCC countries, for example, haven't had until now, obviously we've now got corporate income tax in some jurisdictions, but the tax almost doesn't come into it. And therefore, wouldn't be top of everyone's thought process when deciding how to structure this. So then if, if a couple of them then leave, for example, Saudi and go and live in the United States or they go and live in Germany or France or somewhere and don't think about whether this is relevant or not, I think it will become relevant very quickly and potentially very problematic. And one of the things that I like to do when we're putting together trust deeds or PTC governing documents is put in there a requirement that basically the director has a duty to inform the board of any time they move so that yep. the, the tax considerations can be reconsidered because that's obviously a, a, a huge thing. Absolutely. With increased re- regulation now, in any event, the change of residency of a, a director of a PTC in a in a jurisdiction where PTCs are regulated, the whoever's responsible for anti-money laundering would be and compliance would be needing to know that anyway. They'd have to know that from a local compliance point of view. Depending on where it is, some of the structures don't make a requirement that anybody be designated to to do that. But I, I want to go back and talk a little bit about the, the the family issues because I think that this is a very important issue because I think a lot of times you have family members on the board that are also beneficiaries. And then you have the situation where, as you rightly said, you have some family members that are on the board, some that aren't. Some of the family members that are on the board might be beneficiaries as well. It that is just ripe for all kinds of issues between family members and, and, and infighting that can result in lawsuits. It can result in different family members fighting on on the board and and, and basically, you know, causing a stalemate on the board where nothing's happening with the foundation or, or the PTC anymore because it's just caught in, in a deadlock. And I think. That is one of the big benefits to having a professional board, or at least having some professionals on the board that can act as mediators to try to to rein this in, 
And I've even seen some PTCs and foundation governing documents where they've even included dispute resolution clauses when it comes to family members, because this is obviously a, a huge issue. Absolutely. And the conflict of interests that a board member of a PTC who's also a beneficiary would have would automatically, uh, with any sort of good governance being applied, have to recuse themselves from any decisions relating to to the trust. That might affect nearly every decision that the board has to make, in theory, because just about every decision will affect an individual as a beneficiary. And therefore, it's got to be better to have non-beneficiaries being on the board of the PTC and avoiding that problem. If you can't avoid it, then yeah, proper governance to make sure that people do recuse themselves or from any decision that might affect them as a beneficiary is one thing. And of course, adding in the extra layer of having a protector of the trust, the underlying trusts, means that even if the trustees make a decision and there's a questionable decision because of the conflict of interest that hasn't really been dealt with, an independent protector can of course override that and and veto it which might get you back into the realms of stalemate, but nevertheless, it's part of a governance structure and the mechanisms of how to prevent things going wrong. So if, for example, the independent protector is not satisfied that the board member, who's also a beneficiary, has properly recused themselves from making the trustee decision, then that decision can be stopped, depending on how the trust deed is drafted and whether or not there is a protector. So most PTCs I I come across do have a separate protector to each trust. And that usually is somebody who is not a beneficiary. And that, I think, is a crucial part of the whole control mechanism. No, I I completely agree with you. I'm a big fan of, of, of protectors, especially independent protectors who are not a beneficiary, because that's going to allow them to make independent decisions that are going to be fair to everybody. Because I think you're absolutely right. A lot of times during the life of the settler or the founder, they're able to maintain, I don't want to say a certain level of control, but at least a certain level of, of influence that that things generally go in the intended direction. But for lack of a better word, when shit hits the fan is when the, the founder or settler dies and it's left to the kids and the grandkids and everybody else. And then you have all of these people that are different, different personalities different levels of education, different points in their lives, different opinions on investments and business, different risk appetites. And then you have all these people fighting for their way because they think it's the right way. And it's just a nightmare. Absolutely. I think the avoiding all of those situations has got to be better. There is pent up disputes and ill feeling between classes of beneficiaries or individual beneficiaries who've really got an axe to grind in relation to family wealth distribution, a lot of them will not come to the surface whilst the settler or founder is still alive because there's always that fear that they will just be excluded from the class of beneficiaries just for being for threatening to cause trouble. So everything gets put off, it festers, and of course once that settler or founder is dead, that's when everybody comes out of their cave and starts to hiring lawyers to to try and attack the structure. And that can be built up over decades. I'm determined to get my fair share of this structure. And the fear of being, as I say, excluded from benefit stops that. But if only the settler, really with the protector's consent, has got the, the ability to recommend additions or removals of, of beneficiaries, from a beneficial class, then nothing will happen until that point in time. The trust litigation lawyers, I think, will be rubbing their hands with Lee at that particular point in time because that gives them a lot of work for many years to come. No, for sure. And I think this brings us back full circle to what we were discussing before is this is the point in time where if the PTC or foundation didn't have proper governance, where there's a risk that beneficiary might succeed against a a, a director or a counselor for not properly executing their duties or potentially even getting the trust or foundation set aside. It's probably not going to be during the settler or founder's lifetime that this is going to come up. It's going to come up after the death when the infighting begins and they start attacking, especially if they have knowledge that there wasn't really proper governance, because then they know that definitely increases their chances of success in any sort of litigation or claims. 
Yeah, it's not just, I think, on the death of the settler or founder. I think it's possibly if that settler or founder is getting divorced as well and you've got, you know, a big legal divorce settlement battle going on whilst the settler is still alive. I think you can get sucked into these types of issues even at that stage. But that's more with the current generation, if you like, or between husband and wife or spouse rather than with the next generation of heirs who perhaps need the or out of the way in order to make their case. So, yeah, it's a similar, slightly different, but really quite similar issues that, that will arise during the lifetime. David, I really want to thank you for your time today. To sum up our conversation, there, there's a lot of value to having an independent director on the board. One, they're going to bring the knowledge and experience for proper g- governance and, and, and trust or foundation and administration. They're also going to potentially help solve tax issues that may arise if all of the directors were in high tax jurisdictions, tax is something that definitely needs to be considered. You also want to consider insurance, which is very important. And I think one of the main things which we closed off with here is to maintain balance and and fairness throughout the family and avoid that infighting and lawsuits. Yep. I think you've covered it very well there, Jimmy. (laughs) Well, David, thank you again. And I, I look forward to the next time. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.